Welcome to the Adaptations of Biodiversity to Climate Change module. The objectives of this module will be to explore the options that are available to conservation managers to prevent biodiversity being lost as a consequence of climate change. This material is prepared by Graham von Maltitz of the CSIR. This section will start off looking at adaptation and understanding what we mean by adaptation. Two parallel research themes, one on strategic biodiversity conservation research and one on climate change, both of which are covered in detail in other modules, lead to the inevitable conclusion that biodiversity is likely to be lost as a consequence of climate change. We will look at a brief history of what has led to the current conservation status in the subregion and trends that are currently taking place in conservation. Finally, we will look at the adaptation options that are available to conservation managers in order to mitigate the impacts of climate change. From the perspective of a biological organism, there are several ways a species may adapt to the changing climate. Firstly, they may be persisters. That is, they may be pre-adapted to the new climate and will therefore persist in the new climatic envelope. Dispersers are organisms which will move with the climatic envelope. In other words, they will track the climate. They may be able to do this autonomously, or they may be facilitated dispersers that require human assistance in order to find their new habitat. It is also likely that some species will benefit from the changed climatic conditions, and their range will grow due to the new climatic envelope being better suited to them than the previous envelope. Hence, these species are termed expanders. Failing this, a species is likely to go extinct. We've excluded evolution as an adaptation option available to species under the current conditions of climate change. This is on the basis that the current rate of climate change is understood to be considerably faster than anything historically experienced, and it is unlikely that any species other than those with the shortest life cycles will be able to evolve at the same rate. This does not exclude the possibility, however, that some species will adapt in the future to more stable climatic conditions after the change process is complete. Our main focus in this adaptation section is not on other species adaptation processes, but rather on the adaptation options available to humans to ensure that we will minimize species loss as a consequence of climate change. What we will do is firstly look at past trends in conservation and preservation, in order to understand what has led to the current state of conservation and the disposition of conservation areas in the subregion. We will then consider new trends that are taking place in the field of conservation, particularly strategic conservation planning tools. Finally, we will then look at the adaptation options that are available to society to minimize the rate of climate change driven species extinction. The fact that anthropogenic influences are causing global warming has evolved from being a hypothesis to a generally accepted reality, though there is still extensive disagreement around the magnitude of the predicted change. From a biodiversity perspective, there are rapid advances in both strategic conservation planning and the understanding of distributional spreads of species through climatic envelope modelling. Combining forecasts of climate change with dynamic species movement models allows us to start considering the conservation strategies that would be needed to conserve biodiversity in a climatically changed future. Before considering options for this future, it is useful for us to consider what factors led to the distribution of current conservation areas. Current conservation strategies are by no means maximized solutions to conserve current biodiversity, let alone the biodiversity that will be found in a changed climate. Conservation in southern Africa has a long history. In fact, there is some evidence that a number of conservation practices were taking place prior to colonization by the colonial powers. This can be found through factors such as the occurrence of sacred forests, areas that were set aside specifically as hunting areas, and also the fact that numerous taboos and other cultural norms were used to protect certain species and prevent the over-exploitation of certain species. Conservation as we know it started in the late 19th and early 20th century and followed two parallel paths. Firstly, there were the large game and nature reserves that we are most familiar with. These evolved predominantly from hunting areas and primarily to provide protection for the large mammals that were hunted previously. Some of these have evolved into being ecotourism areas, but the predominant land use on these areas has been strict preservation and preservationist attitudes. In a parallel move, there are a number of forest reserves created through the sub-region. These were normally created for sustainable harvesting of valuable wood species, and in some cases protection of indigenous forests. 
Forest reserves were also set up in many cases for catchment reserve purposes. Throughout the subregion, there were common trends in early conservation. Firstly, the valuable trees and animals were owned by the state, and the use of them was primarily for the privileged and the rich. Forced removal of local resident populations was common, and an aspect such as poaching was considered crime. There was strong law enforcement and strong state backing, and in addition, there were relatively good budgets to support the conservation initiatives. The initial location of reserves in the subregion was anything but strategic from a biodiversity conservation perspective. Most reserves were set up on land that was not being used for other purposes, and therefore few reserves are found in areas with high agricultural potential. Many reserves are located in areas with high disease probability, particularly malaria and tsetse areas. And equally, reserves are normally set up in areas that had low human population density, as this didn't require translocation of people out of the reserves. Reserves are also often found in areas with extreme climates, either very cold areas or very hot areas. And mountainous areas with low agricultural potential and low potential for settlement also are areas that are common for reserves. Forest patches also in South Africa are frequently selected as areas for reserves, and clearly biodiversity was not the main consideration in this process. This map shows the major ecoregions of southern Africa, using as a basis the WWF ecoregion map. Superimposed on this in red are the conservation areas. As can be seen, South Africa takes a very different strategy to conservation than to the rest of southern Africa. In South Africa, there are fairly low levels of conservation, and conservation is in a number of small reserves scattered throughout the country. By contrast, in the rest of southern Africa, there tend to be very large centralized reserves. Conservation of biodiversity takes place at a number of different levels. There are formally recognized reserves, often considered IUCN reserves, and these are typically the nature reserves, but there are also a lot of other protected areas that act as areas for biodiversity protection, but which are less formally recognized, things like state forests, wildlife management or hunting areas, and particularly private game reserves in some South African countries like South Africa, Zimbabwe and Namibia. These are often not reflected in conservation statistics. In addition, there are a number of other areas that provide a limited degree of conservation and that are not considered in conservation statistics at all. These are things like unused farmlands and farming practices that have a low impact on biodiversity. Mapane woodland can be used as an example of a vegetation type which has been extensively conserved in the region. Mapane vegetation is found almost exclusively within the low-lying, hot and arid river valleys of the major river systems in the tropical areas of southern Africa. The tree species, Colloquius bonum mapane, is the dominant species in this vegetation and forms almost monospecific stands. Although this vegetation has relatively limited biodiversity, it is fairly good from a conservation perspective in terms of its ecotourism potential, in that most of the so-called Big Five animal species are found within this vegetation type. This map shows the conservation status of Mpani woodland in southern Africa. The red signifies conservation areas, and it is overlaid on the pink of the Mpani vegetation. As can be seen, Mpani is exceptionally well conserved in almost all countries, with the possible exception of Angola. The history of Mopani conservation probably has more to do with the fact that this vegetation is very unsuitable for human settlement due to malaria infections, tsetse, as well as being in a hot, arid area. Conservation in this area is probably more historically linked to its poor agricultural potential than its conservation importance. Within South Africa, a number of biodiversity hotspots are recognised. One of the most important of these is the Cape Floristic region, or as it is more commonly called, the Fainbos region where there's an incredible 7,000 species, of which almost 80% are endemic to the region. Another area with high species biodiversity is the succulent Karoo area, with 4,800 species, 40% of which are endemic. Over the next few maps, we'll have a look at the location of these areas, and show that in these areas there is by and large fairly low conservation, despite their high biodiversity importance. This map shows the major ecoregions of southern Africa. The two biodiversity hotspots we will be looking at are the Cape Floristic region, shown in the southwest of the country, and the succulent Karoo, shown in green and extending up to the border with Namibia.
This map shows the location of the succulent karoo biome. As can be seen, a very limited portion of this biome is conserved. This despite the fact that the biome has both high species diversity and a very high level of endemism. It is typified by small succulents and sparse individual plants and occurs in the Karoo and up the west coast of South Africa into Namibia. Most importantly, less than 0.5% of it is formally conserved, although the extent of land transformation in the region is considerably less than in the west coast Rhinosterfeld, for instance. This map shows the location of the Feinbos vegetation, the Cape Floristic Kingdom. It's under extreme threat from urbanization and agriculture. And, as can be seen from the map, there are fairly few formal conservation reserves in the area. These reserves are also mostly limited to extreme slopes and mountain peaks. But as we will show in the next slide, this is a misrepresentation of the amount of conservation in the area. This slide adds mountain catchment areas and forestry areas to the formal conservation areas of the previous slide. As can be seen, this greatly increases the amount of protected area within the Feinbos. However, the protected areas are almost exclusively within the mountain Feinbos areas, and the low-lying Rhinosterfeld gets almost no conservation. Rhinosterfeld is an important area from an agricultural perspective, and has therefore undergone a large amount of transformation, making conservation of this felt type even more important. Based on the vegetation types shown previously, two extremes of conservation strategies can be seen. With the Mopani felt, there are very high levels of conservation, despite the fact that this area is not a centre of endemism, and despite the fact that there is almost no transformation of this felt vegetation type. By contrast, the west coast Rhinoster felt is almost totally transformed, yet there is only 1.7% of it conserved. Mountain Feinbos, on the other hand, has a far lower level of transformation, due primarily to the fact that the mountains can't really be used for other land uses, such as agriculture and in this area there is therefore a far greater percentage of conservation. This map shows the location of conservation areas in Madagascar. In order to view it with more clarity, just click on the image to enlarge it. Madagascar is an area again known for its high species biodiversity and high species endemism, yet as can be seen there is a very low level of formal conservation, and this is skewed to one or two vegetation types. It can be seen from this map that the coastal vegetation on the east coast of Africa is very poorly conserved. Coastal forest vegetation stretching in from the middle of Mozambique, through the Tanzanian and Kenyan coasts, and up into Ethiopia has almost no formal conservation. By contrast, many of the savanna vegetation types in the centre of the countries have fairly extensive conservation, due to their reduced agricultural and habitation potential. From the late 1800s through to about 1970, a trend was seen of increasing areas in southern Africa for conservation. However, from about 1970 onwards, there is almost no increase in the conservation area. This largely correlates with the end of the colonial era. After independence, most African states put greater emphasis on social good and increasing social benefits, rather than environmental issues. As can be expected, the total number of parks shows a very similar trend to the area under conservation. Again, there is a rapid increase in park number from about 1940 through to 1970, after which the number of parks flattens off. The exception is South Africa, where there are lots of small parks, and these haven't been included in the statistics. The other area of formal state conservation levels off from about 1970 onwards. There is a new trend of private ownership of conservation land, as can be seen from the graph, this is a rapidly increasing proportion of the conservation estate. A number of facts have led to this, one of which is changes in legislation, which effectively allows private landowners ownership of the wildlife on their land. A further factor has been the economics of cattle management. There are fairly strong arguments that cattle management has been artificially supported through a number of state subsidies, and without these subsidies, wildlife management, in many instances, is more economically viable. The following are some of the trends that are seen in old-style conservation. Firstly, there was a preservationist attitude, that conservation areas were meant to be preserved and not used. There also managed to some form of what was seen to be a pre-colonial, pre-man, pristine state. Quite what this was is hard to define, 
But it's clearly in the minds of most conservation managers that there is some sort of pristine state to which the area should be managed. Management also normally excluded people and separated conservation from other land uses, often putting up large fences between them. Conservation was primarily the domain of the state, and the state owned the wildlife and the trees, both within and outside the conservation areas. A number of pressures have caused changes in the old conservation paradigm. Firstly, population growth means that there aren't large unpopulated areas left in Africa. Instead, there is a growing population adjacent to conservation areas, and these people in many instances have poor livelihoods and are desperate for land. Equally, there's an inability of police to manage the conservation areas. This is largely due to changes in budgets, but also because of the increased population pressure. Equally, there's a change of political priorities. Social issues are seen as far more of a priority than they were in the past. Land is also no longer available for the expansion of conservation areas, and there is a general cut in expenditure on conservation in favour of more social development. Conservation paradigms have changed in relation to these pressures placed on conservation. Currently, there is more of an emphasis on conservation rather than on strict preservation, and sustainable uses of resources are seen as being important in many areas. Systems are allowing for change rather than being held in some past static state. And equally, there is a realization that conservation must pay its way, and therefore tourism and other value addition activities are looked at for conservation land. A new trend is also the global contribution to third world conservation. This is being funded through global funds such as the GEF or the Global Environment Facility, which is helping set up conservation areas in a number of places in southern Africa. A further new trend is the formation of what are termed transfrontier conservation areas, or what are sometimes referred to as peace parks. These are large conservation areas across countries, often linking and joining existing conservation areas. Unlike conservation in the past, these transfrontier conservation areas have a very strong link to rural development, and with a strong focus on uplifting the local communities. These conservation areas are also based on strong political backing, and in many cases rely heavily on international funding, such as GEF funding, mentioned previously, or funding and support from individual donor countries. A number of current trends are impacting on conservation. One consequence of the colonial period is that most resources were owned by the state. This was particularly true for the communal areas. A current trend, therefore, is the devolution of resource ownership from the state back to local communities that own the land, and allowing them to truly manage the land. The growth in tourism revenue is also imp an important driver because of the links between tourism and conservation. This has been driven by a number of factors, many of which relate to changes in agriculture. The changes in agriculture are related to changes in their subsidies, and the real-term declines in world food prices, as well as a globalization of markets. For instance, cattle have become far less profitable, and game revenue and tourism revenue is seen as far more favorable for many, particularly in the more arid areas. Where cattle ranching was once the main activity throughout most of the subregion in the past, game ranching is now taking on greater and greater importance. In South Africa, for instance, game ranching is currently estimated to occupy about 5 million hectares, or 8.5% of the land area. As such, it exceeds the area of land currently under state conservation, and it's estimated that there are five to 8,000 game ranchers within the country. Another trend, particularly in communal areas, is to see conservation as part of a community development initiative. This is often referred to as community-based natural resource management, CBNRM, and the idea is to link development and conservation through joint management efforts. This is happening in the conservation arena around game reserves, and also in the forestry arena around what is often referred to as joint forestry management. A common vehicle to achieve this is through community-public-private sector partnerships, for instance through private sector running a game lodge on communal land, with joint profit sharing between the community and the private investor. A number of countries have national CBNRM programs, such as Campfire Program in Zimbabwe, and similar programs in Botswana and Namibia. A similar trend is the formation of conservancies, 
As was pointed out earlier, the location of current conservation areas in southern Africa is anything but strategic. Currently, there's a new trend towards strategic conservation planning, where complex computer models and facilitation is used to identify the best areas for conservation. In many cases, this is supported through international funding, such as GEF funding. But in South Africa, there are a number of con current initiatives where strategic conservation is being considered. This includes the CAPE program in the Feinbos, the SKEP program on the Wild Coast, and the STEP program. There are a number of global trends impacting on conservation as well. One of the main ones is habitat fragmentation through land use transformation. And this is particularly true for the high agricultural areas in the country. Global warming is obviously also becoming a reality. As a consequence of global warming, many species are likely to lose their current habitats, or their habitat will move in space to a new area. The current rate of global climate change is far too fast for evolutionary adaptation. As has been mentioned earlier, there are a number of adaptation responses available to individual plant and animal species as a consequence of climate change. Firstly, species can persist or expand into a new climate, which is still favourable to them. Equally, species can disperse or move with the climate as it moves across the landscape. This can be autonomous, in other words, the species can do it itself, or it can be facilitated, in other words, the species can't move on its own, but it could move given human assistance. And this could be through new reserves, management of dispersal corridors, or in extreme cases, actual translocation. Where species won't have a new habitat available in the future, then preservation ex situ is the only option. And this could be in zoological gardens or herbaria. Failing this, the species will become extinct. The following adaptation strategies are suggested for persist or expand a species. Firstly, providing the species is not already threatened, and provided it is well conserved in the current reserve network, it is probable that no additional action needs to be taken. However, if the species becomes invasive, it may be necessary to prevent it having a negative impact on other species. There is a high probability of alien exotic species invading new areas as a consequence of climate change, and this needs to be carefully considered and watched. Many species, both plant and animal, will have the ability to move through the landscape to track their preferred climate as the climate envelope moves through the landscape. Providing these species are not already threatened, and providing there are migratory routes available to them, then no further action may be needed. However, it is very likely that for many species there is a necessity to conserve migratory pathways. This could be through formal conservation, or it could be through managing the matrix, in other words, the land outside of conservation areas that forms migratory pathways. Care must be taken to ensure that pathways are suitable for species. For instance, many species may not be able to migrate over different soil types. Land transformation is also likely to be a large barrier to migration. For all species, careful monitoring will be needed to ensure that they are able to migrate. For this reason, Strategic conservation planning needs to consider the future habitats and species patterns in the future. For many of the species that are able to find new habitats in the future, it's very likely that some level of human facilitation will be needed to help them migrate. In a simple case, this might be simply managing the areas outside of conservation areas to ensure that these areas are friendly for the species to migrate through them. In this regard, community-based conservation may be an important strategy. And equally, it might be important to form what are termed contractual reserves, where the landowner enters into a contract with conservation authorities to keep his land for conservation purposes. Less severe and less expensive methods could be through incentives to landowners, use of private reserves, and just general education. In many cases, landowners are not aware of the need for migration, and simply understanding the benefits that they can give to conservation might be sufficient for them to engage in conservation. It seems clear that many species will not have suitable habitats in the future as a consequence of climate change. In many cases there's a large degree of unknown involved as well, therefore some level of ex situ conservation is prudent. This could be through gene banking, conservation in zoos, or replanting in botanical gardens. A number of conclusions can therefore be drawn from this section. Firstly, 
current reserve patterns have historic rather than strategic conservation objectives, and therefore are not well configured to best conserve biodiversity. However, a number of new strategic conservation planning tools are being developed that allow for reconfiguring reserves to better conserve biodiversity. These tools, however, need to consider the impacts of climate change, and strategic conservation needs to manage for climate change, rather than managing for constant state or trying to manage the past distribution patterns. It is likely that off-reserve conservation needs to be a critical component of the strategy. In other words, what we have termed matrix management. One of the ways of achieving this is devolution of ownership of user rights, and making it worthwhile for the farmer to conserve biodiversity on his own land. Individual biological organisms will have different responses to climate change. Some may well benefit from the changing climate, but it's predicted that many others will become extinct as a consequence of climate change. There are a number of management options available, and these are likely to be specific to specific organisms. There's a need to configure reserves that don't necessarily best conserve the current configuration of biodiversity, but rather that predict gradients and migratory corridors that allow biodiversity to move through the landscape. Environmental gradient protection may well be a key component of such a conservation strategy. In addition, there'll be a need to intervene to help many of the species. This may be through helping the species translocate through space. New conservation paradigms are needed in the conservation fraternity to think of moving species to areas where they didn't occur in the past. And probably the most important strategy for ensuring the conservation of biodiversity, given a climatically changing environment, is that areas outside of the reserves must be conserved or made as biodiversity friendly as possible. This is not to say that a strategically aligned conservation network that protects conservation given climate change is not important. Rather, it is a necessity to expand conservation to as large an area as possible. Many species will have to migrate through areas that aren't covered by the current reserve network. In addition, areas outside of the reserve network may become important refugia for species as the habitat within the reserves is decreased due to climate change.